is just a huge, huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Carl Ulrich Volz all the way from Switzerland. He was born in 1964, achievement of dental degree in Ulm, Germany, dissertation on evidence of amalgam elements and dental pulp among amalgam patients, residency at the Southern German Center for Oral Implantology, 1992 foundation of his first private practice specializing in metal free dentistry, 1998 certification in biological dentistry, and a 99 certification in implantology, founder of the Bodeni Zunkelink. The Bodensee Zunk... I know I'm not saying that right. How do you say it? The founder of the what? Bodensee Zahnklinik. That means cleaning of Lake of Constance. Okay. Has made a name for itself primarily in the field of all ceramic and implantology. He's co-author of the patient guidance booklet, Healthy Teeth, All's Well, and the Implantology Guidebook. From 2001 to 2004, he's development consultant with the achievement of the Zirconium Oxide Implant Z-Look, one of the first approved ceramic implants. 2004, founder of the company Z-Systems. 2006, founder of the first ever use of ultrasonic implants. And 2007, fast founder of ultrasonic applications in membrane technology for bone augmentation. 2007, latest generation of ATZ ceramic implants and CEO of the company Swiss Dental Solutions. 2002 to 12, development of the first two-piece ceramic implants. 2013, development of the newest generation of one-piece hybrid implants and maturation of the short cone concept, according to Dr. Volz, which allows you immediate implantation after extraction in the region of molars and immediate temporary restorations. 2016, he founded the Swiss BioHealth Clinic for Biological Dentistry and Medicine. And in 2000, since 2001, you're not going to believe this, he has performed more than 18,000 ceramic implant placements. I cannot tell you what an honor it is to have you come on the show today. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so for inviting me. Well, the, the show is called Dentistry Uncensored, so we don't want to talk about anything that anyone agrees on. We only want to talk about what people don't agree on. And I want to ask you this. When you place titanium implants, in five years, about 20% have paraimplantitis. Um, at nine years, anywhere between 40 and 60% have paraimplantitis. A lot of people are starting to think that maybe titanium is not as biocompatible and inert as it is. Do you think titanium is uh, part of the problem of periimplantitis? And do you think switching to ceramic implants that you use um, reduce the incidence of periimplantitis? Yes, definitely. It's, um, but it's not the fault of the titanium industry or the titanium implants. It's the fault of uh, the change in our environment. So that we started to add everywhere titanium oxide to and nutrition to chewing gum whatsoever to cosmetics and on the other hand that EMF is becoming uh, stronger and stronger by a year. The, um, I, for many years I had the feeling that the parimplantitis could be, so, so my belief today is that the parimplantitis is nothing else than a titanium intolerance. So I already had the idea about 10 years ago because if you look at the mechanism of titanium intolerance, you need some particles in the soft or hard tissue. Those par particles are going to activate the macrophages. They are going to activate TNF-alpha and interleukin-1 beta, what leads to systemic processes and to local processes. And the main thing is that it activates the osteoclast. That means you're going to lose bone. The... Um, the first uh, proof we had already a few years ago when there was a paper um, uh, published from University of uh, Freiburg that showed that in 75% of preimplantitis they found uh, titanium particles around um, ti um, titanium implants in case of preimplantitis. And so uh, recently, a study was uh, 2017. A study was published, I think, in October, which proved uh, finally that periimplantitis is caused by titanium particles. The problem is now that the treatment of titanium periimplantitis is um, that you open the gum, you clean the titanium implant with um, maybe a titanium brush, or you shape the titanium implant. That means you are releasing even more titanium particles into the system. 
And so that is like you would pour oil into a fire. That is why treatment of peripheral never have, has worked. Wow. Well, what, what percent of the world's implants last year in 2017, what percent do you think were ceramic versus titanium? Um, we know in the German-speaking country like Austria, Switzerland and Germany, it was about, let's say, 3 to 5 percent. In U.S., maybe 2 percent. And I think in the rest of the world, it's less than 1 percent at the moment. Well, what was it in Austria, Switzerland and Germany? I would say, uh, as I know, around 5 percent of the market. So what do you, I, I've noticed um, major implant companies are, are consolidating, and I notice they're all now coming out with ceramic implants. What do you think the tipping point will be? When, when do you think, um, you know, you even see it in, in bicycle riding where these Scandinavian yeah. countries, um, it's, you know, it's like only 1% rode their bike and the government kept working, got it to 2 to 3 But they said the tipping point was about 5%, and then it exploded to like 25 or 30%. What, what, do, what do you think will be the tipping point to get ceramic to replace titanium? I don't know, and I don't think that uh, ceramic is going to replace titanium. Um, and it's hard to predict. Um, if you go back 12 years to um, 2005 at the World Congress uh, in Las Vegas of for implantology, the, at this time CEO of Nobel BioCare, who was the world market leader of titanium implants, Helene Canepas, she was saying that she believes, strongly believes, that in 2010, no patient would anymore uh, accept any metal-based implant in, uh, in his mouth. So uh, now we have 2018, and it's still just 5%. But the point is that um, since the big companies, so we see, since the big companies like Strawman and Chemlock and Nobel Biocare, they're all going for ceramic, um, it has become um, much stronger momentum. So it's hard to predict. I'm now working with ceramic implants since almost 20 years. And, but we see in our field a growth of about 50%, 50 to 70% per year. So I believe in about um, five years, there will be about 20 to 50% of the market could be ceramic in the Western world. And why do you think... Um Germany, Austria, Switzerland are leading the way in this at 5% of the implants versus USA 2, the rest of the world 1. What, what do you think makes um, Germany, Austria, Switzerland um, at the forefront of this? Yeah, I think because it was invented in this place. Um, so it was not me actually who invented the ceramic implant. I was just uh, maybe the first who started to place it um, uh, in very high numbers. And before me, there was Professor Sandhaus already 20 years before and Professor um, uh, Willi Schulte from the University of Tübingen. He had ceramic implants and Dr. Rudel in Hamburg uh, was placing uh, zirconia implants already 40 years ago. So um, I think this area um, around Lake of Constance uh, and as well, some of the biggest industries for ceramic is located close to this place. So if you go about 150 kilometers, um, it's about nearly 100% of all ceramic hips worldwide are produced in this area. And so I believe that is um, the reason why we are so strong here in Lake of Constance with ceramic implants. Do you think a lot of this also comes from a history of um, being first in not liking amalgam. Um, you, your paper, your dissertation, evidence of amalgam elements in dental pulp among amalgam patients. It seems like you first realize particles of the amalgam, the mercury, silver, zinc, copper, tin, uh, were getting into the tissue, the dental pulp. And now, a decade after that, you're realizing that the metals from the titanium are getting into the uh, tissue. Yes, yeah, so I was very lucky that I was able to do my doctor thesis 28 years ago about um, amalgam. And so when I started all, actually my, my professor was a pro-amalgam, 
And when I studied all the um, literature about amalgam, I saw that it's not as safe as it was said at this time. And I could show in my doctor's thesis that within hours, one or two days, uh, if you don't put an underfilling, the amalgam was um, already found in the pulp of the tooth. And uh, so it was very strange and made me very, um, uh, yes, yeah, so I always, I looked for metal-free um, uh, alternatives. So I was one of the first who started with the CEREC system, which was very close to this area as well. So it was developed by, um, uh, at the uh, University of Zurich, very close to my place. And then in 98, we've been one of the first who started with ceramic crowns. So that was the DCS milling machine. And then um, at the end of the last millennium, it was 98, 99, the patient started to ask for ceramic implants. And I was very lucky because I had the owner of one of the um, producers for ceramic hips on my uh, treatment chair in, as a patient. And so this um, company helped me to develop the first ceramic implants. A lot of Americans say that, they'll, they'll just say uh, things like, um, Europe banned amalgam. Um, I, I, I don't see that, talking to dentists around Europe. I know a lot of dentists in Europe don't use amalgam, but have any countries formally banned amalgam where it's against the law to place a silver, mercury, zinc, tin filling? As I... As I know, uh, Sweden has completely, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that Sweden has completely banned amalgam. Uh, as well in Austria, I think it's banned for children younger than 14 years. In Germany, it's banned for pregnant women and for children. So, um, well, what's, but the age, what's the age of the children in Germany? Pregnant women? And I think under 14. And children but under I'm not 14? So, so, so they're... So. So they're so it is against the law in Germany to place a silver filling in, in pregnant women and children under 14. Of course. And you think it's the same in um, Austria under children? And you think in Sweden it's banned completely? Yes, as I know, we recently had a meeting with um, um, the family members of Professor Steiskal. She, uh, she's the founder of the Melissa test. And she's working about metal alloys and metals in general and allergy about 40 years. And she's from Sweden, Karolinska Institute. And as I remember, they told that in the meantime, it's completely uh, forbidden. Very, very interesting. It's, I'd still, um, it's still widely used uh, around the world. Um, what, what percent of the world fillings do you think are done in uh, silver fillings versus composites? I would say 50%, something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Well, that's the number I keep hearing, 50-50. The problem with um, banning amalgam in um, poor countries is when I go there, they don't have the uh, isolation technique. They're, they're, they're doing composites without rubber dams, without high-speed suction. And yeah. uh, it, it's a very technique-sensitive filling that you would really need to have. Um, you know, isolation and uh, uh, higher tech. So, um, so tell me, um, how is, so you are the founder and CEO of Swiss Dental Solutions. Uh, what are my dentists going to that site? What are they going to find on your site? Um, on this site, you're going to find everything about the ceramic implants um, themselves, about properties and uh, um uh, videos, um, how do you place the implants? So it's more about education and information. Um, but if you go to the website of our clinic, the Swiss Powerhouse Clinic, um, there you're going to find. What, what, um, what's that website? Swiss Biohealth. Okay, so Swiss Biohealth. So Swiss Biohealth.com. Um, what, what is on that website? That's more education? Yes. So the point is that um, to understand what we do, so the overall concept, that is the Swiss biohealth concept, that is the concept about integrating biological medicine, um, like Dr. Klinghardt and many others, and biological dentistry um, 
to one treatment concept because we can't separate one from the other. And um, we are working very hard to make it always better and safer and smoother. That is the Swiss biohealth concept. And um, in many cases, we need a ceramic implant. So the ceramic implant is just a part, a piece of the Swiss biohealth concept. Um, uh, especially for those patients who already have lost a tooth or have to get a tooth removed, like a root canal treated tooth. So um, the Swiss biohealth concept is the bigger picture that's all about health. That is what I'm mainly interested. So I developed the ceramic implant not because I had the idea that this could be a nice business model or concept. I developed that because it was the missing link for biological dentistry. Because if you practice biological dentistry, you have to remove root canal treated teeth, of course. Um, but if you have got no um, solution for the problem, the problem is a root canal treated tooth. And that was the, was the issue with Western Price 100 years ago, that he already knew about the, the, the dangers of root canal treated teas, but he had no solution for it. So when he removed root canal treated teas, there was a gap. You had to do the preparation on the neighboring teas or prosthesis, whatsoever. And today we've got a solution. So we do 95%, we do immediate implants. That means you remove a tooth and in the same minute you place an immediate implant. Um, and that is something what completely changed the world of biological dentistry. So I can see that since we do that and since it works uh, with a very high success rate above 98 percent about 20 percent of my patients are dentists actually wow there's that that what a testament if 20 percent of your patients are dentists um this is dentistry uncensored so we don't like to talk about anything everyone agrees on what would you say to a dentist that says well wait a minute zirconium is a metal is Zirconium is a chemical element with atomic number 40 located in group 4 from the periodic chart elements. Its symbol is ZR. It is a hard metal resistant to corrosion, similar to steel. How, how do you have a metal-free practice with a zirconium implant? Okay, so we have to distinguish between zircon, what is a pure metal, and between zirconia, what is a metal oxide. And the metal oxide is a pure 100% ceramic, what has nothing to do with the metal. This is like, for I'm giving you another example, like natrium. Natrium is a pure metal, and chloride is a very toxic gas. If you combine both to natrium chloride, it's salt, and it's even essential for your body. So if you combine oxygen, what is a gas, and if you combine zircon, what is a metal, you get uh, zirconia, zirconia, the metal oxide, the zirconium oxide. Actually, it's zirconium dioxide. And zirconium dioxide has 100% ceramic properties. So it has nothing to do, zero, with a metal. Very good. Um, another question is, um, explain what biological dentistry is. How, how is biological dentistry different than conventional dentistry? What, what, do, you, what do you mean by... Um, a holistic approach for bioimmunological dental solutions. Yes, the, the point is that on one hand, we know that, um, the, that the head is not separated from your body. It's all together. And uh, it might be even the most important part of your body. And so we can see that the oral situation is, um, um, has got the trigeminous nerve, what is one out of 12 brain nerves. But it's just one out of 12 and it occupies 50% of the brain, of the space. So that shows the importance of the oral situation of the oral um, uh, cavity. And as well, all the meridians, 100% of all meridians, they are running through, through T's. Um, there's not one meridian what is not running through the area of a tooth. And in biological dentistry, we, um, so actually the father of biological dentistry is Weston Price, who um, invented, I would say, the whole thing uh, more than 100 years ago. And um, in biological dentistry, that is, so we don't say holistic or natural something, we say biological, immunological, because everything what we do uh, is 
proven by studies. It has something to do with biology and it's medicine um, executed in the mouth. Uh, just to explain in a few words, so all um, uh, the main cause for all chronic disease is always chronic stress. There is no other cause for chronic disease. It's chronic stress. And because stress leads to the release of um, uh, adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol, that is completely shutting down the immune system and the healing system. But it was meant as a flight, hide, and fight mode, mode to just um, be switched on for a few seconds, maybe hours or, or, or days. But we in the Western world, we are living more or less 24-7 in the stress mode. So the immune system is shut down for weeks and months and even years. And um, that is finally making a system uh, is, uh, acidic, a lack of oxygen. There is no immune system, no healing. So that is the explanation why the student never will become ill during the exams, because all the body is over flood with adrenaline, no adrenaline, and um, even the, the nutrition is poor, lack of sleep, stress, whatsoever. Um, and then right after the exam, the student is becoming ill because then the parasympathetic mode with acetylcholine comes back and is starting to clean all the system. And then the student is with fever. That is what some of you could see when you go into vacation the first one, two, three days, you get, you become ill. That is, that means that your immune system that you have been all the time before in the sympathetic mode. So now coming back to dentistry, there are three main causes for stress in our world of 2018. One is the dental disturbance fields like root kernels, like cavitations, like metals, like amalgams, like leftovers, like uh, titanium implants. The second is um, EMF, uh, microwaves, and the third uh, source is uh, emotions. Um, that is, uh, those are the three main sources for sympathetic mode, for stress mode. Um, Germany has uh, 83 million people and 54,000 dentists. You got a dentist for every 1,500 people. Um, of those 54,000 dentists, how many of them share your feelings about biological dentistry and being metal free? And uh, with regards to, uh, especially with, uh, I, I know they believe, agree with uh, amalgam, but how many of them agree? Of those 54,000 dentists, what percent agree that titanium implant is a problem? That's very difficult, very hard to say, um, because I haven't spoken yet to all of the 54,000 dentists in Germany. <laughs> I know quite a few of them. Um, but uh, at SDS, we have about, so 1,000, 1,500 customers. Um, and so def they definitely f are following our concept. And so this year in our Swiss Biohealth Education Center, we have hosted already in the last four um, months, we have hosted already about four to 500 dentists. And we believe until end of the year, it will be 1,500 dentists again. And we've got 47 courses and more than 30 shadowing days at our education center. So we see that, um, that dentists, they need to be educated, but as soon as they come to our uh, education center, the conversion rate, how we say, is 100%. There was not one dentist who was not 100% convinced when they uh, when when they came for an education, um, so um, as well the 50 dentists we just had from US at our clinic for five days at our education center, um, they 100% um, agreed with the concept. So it's just uh, because everything what we do, everything what we teach uh, makes 100% sense, um, and especially if you do live surgery, what we do nearly every day, you're going to see as an observer how patients improve their health uh, within the surgery. So they, they get rid of uh, certain health issues and pain in the, um, uh, in the spine whatsoever within a few hours. And if, if a dentist was shadowing us or taking a course is seeing that, 
they are understanding that dentistry could be the most fulfilling profession ever. And so that is, we just, it's a lack of information and we just, we have to get the dentist uh, to, um, to the education about biological dentistry. And um, I would say all of them, they're absolutely happy about the concept, what they are going to learn. Now, you mentioned earlier um, Dr. Weston Price, Dr. Weston A. Price, uh, in 1931, a Cleveland dentist, which I love Cleveland. It's also the home of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, and, uh, but um, is nutrition a big part of your institute also? Of course. It is extremely important because um, the... The problem of today is that most of the micronutrients, they are, they are gone from, the, from our food. So our food is, um, uh, tastes nice, smells, wi- smells nice, looks nice, but there's nothing inside. So there's no more minerals, no more um, uh, vit- uh, vitamins. So if you go back 100 years, they had about 20 to 100 times more micronutrients. But on the other side, we should we have today we have a much higher need because we are like um, in the stress mode most of the time, and the micronutrients are kind of the fuel for our engine for every cell. So we have today we have a higher need for minerals for vitamins, but there is nothing left in the food, um, and so we see we are testing in all our patients one hundred percent. We are testing the vitamin D three, for example right before the surgery, and then we test it again after some months when they come back for the pros, uh, pr- prosthetic work. And we see that at the beginning, nearly all patients, they are kind of in the winter sleep mode. They are in the range between 5 and 20 uh, nanograms per milliliter, what is extremely low, that is winter sleep mode. And the immune system could not work with such low levels of vitamin D3. And... So that is an extremely important part of our treatment that we, we are building up the, um, the, the micronutrients of all patients. Um, uh, I would always say it's, it's three parts what is most important. First of all, you have to give the cell. So there is, a, is an ongoing study at Princeton University for 40 years. They have shown that human cells, they could live forever if you if you provide everything what is needed in the cell and if, if you get rid of all the waste. So the second part is always detox and the third part, in my opinion, is to stay away from EMF. That is the three main parts. And um, since we, we, we never start any surgery without having the patient on a perfect nutrition and supplementation protocol. And the very interesting thing is that we have observed that, for example, periodontitis is completely gone if you build up the micronutrients. So periodontitis has nothing, um, and a periodontitis, I mean periodontitis, has nothing to do, in my opinion, it's just my personal opinion, um, but we are talking about uncensored dentistry. So in my opinion, it has nothing to do with, um, with how the patient is cleaning the teeth. It's... Uh, it's uh, something uh, like lack of minerals and vitamins and uh, ginger is going to uh, start to get inflamed and because it's inflamed it's very sensitive and the patient stops cleaning the teeth and then comes the dirt so the dirt is not the beginning of the periodontitis the dirt is um, result of the periodontitis what is caused by micronutrients so you, you said there were three parts. What were the three parts? The second one was detox. The third one, did they it, say the three parts again? So the first is uh, supplementation, nutrition. We have to provide our cell with everything they need. Second is detox. We have to get rid of all the toxins, of all the heavy metals. And uh, the third is staying away from EMF. What, so what, about, what is EMF? EMF is electromagnetic fields. So that is like Wi-Fi and cell tower and so on. Interesting. Um, I want to ask you another dentistry uncensored uh, question. In, in America, I can't speak for Germany, but in America, you have the, um, 
the dermatologist telling you the sun is so bad and cover up and wear sunscreen. And like I'm out here in Arizona, they say, you know, you should not really go outside between 11 and a.m. and 3 p.m. And then you have a lot of nutritionists saying that you need sun at least 10 minutes a day, um, you know, to get vitamin D and melatonin. Uh, so which is it? Is sun good or bad? Sun is good, of course. Um, without sun, there would be not one second. Uh, life would completely stop within one second without uh, the sun. And all the great doctors in the past, like Paracelsus, Hippocrates, they were all saying, without the sun, the illness is going to come in the door. So um, uh, what, is, what is very interesting that recently, just 10 days ago, Hawaii was the first state in the US who banned the sunscreen because there are two very poisoning ingredients inside the sunscreen, and it showed that it destroys the, um, the coral reefs. And what was very interesting, um, when I read the articles about this, um, this new law, they were talking about these incredible toxic poisons, but they were, and how they are destroying the coral, but they were not talking one second about how they could have an impact on, on human beings if you put it on 2.5 square meters of a resorption membrane called your skin. So definitely sun is very good and it's exactly the opposite, the, the opposite than you are saying. You should go in the middle of the day into the sun because um, the most destructive sun to your skin is in the morning and in the evening. It's not in the middle of the day because in the middle of the day you have got the UVB part of the um, of the light, and this is protecting you from um, skin damage. So you should, uh, of course, you should never uh, burn your skin. And after a while, when you get tanned, you're protected by your uh, by your by your tan by your dark skin. And but the best sun is the sun in uh, exactly at noon. Um, you mentioned Weston A. Price. A lot of people um, attribute his, this dentist, uh, to the eventual, uh, the paleo diet. Uh, for you personally, um, do you have, do, are you, do you eat paleolithic? Uh, what, what is your diet consist of? Is it Mediterranean? How would you describe your diet? Um, yeah, so actually, it's in the last 30 years, I followed any diet available. So, I was vegan, I was vegetarian, I tried everything. And so um, the point is, the most important point about any diet is that it never becomes a, a, um, a religion. Because if, you, if it doesn't make you feel good, it's causing stress and that is exactly the opposite of healing and of health. So um, my diet is to follow, uh, let's say about 80 to 85% a good healthy protocol, but we should no, never overdo it because if we get, um, look, for example, um, if you have a look at um, Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs was very slim. He was not never drinking alcohol. He was not smoking. He was just drinking water. He was walking around 20 kilometers per day just, and he was vegan and he died in the age of 55. Why? Because he was completely stressed up the whole life and emotionally, and he was working too much, he never relaxed, and uh, was at all the Wi-Fi all the time um, uh, uh, when he used his iPad. So I believe that is the reason why he died so, in, uh, so young. And so at the moment, I don't think it would be, or let's say it would be nice um, if we could all be vegan. So for saving the earth and saving the animals, it would be, uh, much better to be completely vegan, of course, but like Western Price said, or was saying is that um, if you are ill or um, if you are pregnant, a little child or very old patients, they need some animal protein um, because uh, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, through animal protein, it's easier to receive the full range of the amino acids, what is actually the base for any cell, for any enzymes and, and so on and for all the muscles. So um, 
but that does not mean that you should have a 300 gram uh, piece of meat every single day. So we should have just um, maybe once or twice a week, just a little bit of meat or eggs or uh, fish. And of course the quality, the most important thing, so the quality should be the best uh, available. If you talk about fish, it should be, it's better if you have a sweet water fish and always a river is better than, um, than a lake. So for example, the trout is, uh, I would um, recommend as the most healthy fish is it's about um, seafood. Well, I grew up in the middle of the United States, Kansas. So the favorite fish in Kansas was catfish. Okay. <laughs> Have you ever eaten catfish? Um, there's a lot of uh, people. Do you think the gut microbiome is related to the mouth and their caries rate and their uh, periodontal disease rate? Of course, because it's the same tissue. So when the, when the embryo starts to starts to grow, there's the there's the colon is is from the outside of the embryo the colon is growing inside inside the embryo and the tissue of the sinus the gingiva and the um, and the tissue of the of the gut of the colon is uh, one and the same tissue so um, we see that the periodontitis uh, or any gum disease always comes from the from the colon, from the mic microbiome. What are your thoughts on root canals? There's a lot of holistic dentists who do not believe in root canal therapy. In fact, some of them even extract the root canal tooth. What, what is your views on endodontic therapy root canals? Yes, of course, we have to extract root canal treated teeth because it's a dead organ and there's no other medical doctor would leave a dead organ inside the body um, it's uh, poisoning the patient and there is, it never works. So since we have got the CT scan, we could prove that maybe 95% of all root canals, they've got an um, uh, infection at the tip of the root. And um, so, uh, and, and according to studies, it's proven that from the beginning of a root canal treatment, if you go five years later, if you check five years later and there's no infection at the root, it's a success rate of 20%. So I believe in 2018, we should not talk about um, procedures with a success rate of maybe 20%. We want to talk about procedures with a success rate at least above 90%. Um, the point is that there is a um, uh, um, physical limitation of root canals. Um, the point is that the dentin tubules, what are about 20,000 to 70,000 per square millimeter, the, the size is about 5 microns. The bugs, they've got about uh, 1 to 2 microns, so, so they could easily move into the dentin tubules. But the macrophages, which would, um, which would kill the bugs, They've got a size between 10 and 25 um, microns, so they're sitting on top of the um, uh, of the dentin tubules, and it's like a cat and mouse play. So they can't get inside, and they can't can't kill the bugs. And the bugs are sitting inside, replicating toxins like thioether and mercaptans and so on. And uh, it's proven in studies that this is. Um, uh, that this is very dangerous, actually, those toxins. And um, uh, in my clinic, we are removing all root canals now since 15 years. In any patient, I remove all the root canals. And all of the patients, they improve immediately, right after extraction of the root canal, 3 DTs. It was exactly the same observation Reston Price had more than 100 years ago. And I do that in my courses at the... Um, Swiss Pals Education Center. So on Friday evening, we are injecting in all the dentists attending the course. We are uh, doing neurotherapy in their um, root canal 3 DTs. And then we observe uh, if and how quick and how the symptoms disappear. And in about 90%, the symptoms, especially in the spine, um, 
are going to disappear in those dentists. So um, they 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 feel immediately the connection between the root canal treated tooth and some other parts of their body, and that is why they get completely convinced about that. And uh, it's actually it was proven by Western Price and was proven by Hal Huggins that. Um, uh, that the root canal juice makes absolutely no sense. Now, you know, there's, um, how many endodontists practice in Germany? Practice limited to root canals only? I don't know. I don't know. I think in Germany, it's, uh, we have just very rare endodontists who just do endodontology. So, uh, most of the dentists, they, they do, they are, um, they do uh, surgeries and implants and endodontic all at the same time. So I would say about 80% of German dentists are practicing and endodontology. Yes, I agree. So um, dentistry is delivered differently all around the world. And the United States is very into its nine specialties. But um, um, like, like the United States has 10,800 orthodontists. And there's only like 18,000 in the world. Uh, same, same thing with endodontists. We have like 4,000 in the United States, only 6,000 in the world. Um, most of the other world, uh, the family general dentist does all the procedures. Specialty isn't really as common. But you know that every single one of the 4,000 endodontists in the United States would disagree with you 100%. What would you say to those guys? I mean, they, I they, they do eight root canals a day, five days a week for their whole life. I don't think that they would disagree. There are studies, they prove that the fastest growing uh, part of implantologists comes from, the comes from the endodontologists. So because they quite often, they do root canals and then after a while they extract um, the tooth because of infection and um, then the patient, of course, is not very happy with that, that they first spend a lot of money for the root canal and then they have to spend another money for the implant. So um, more and more endodontologists are going uh, straight for the, for the implant, um, what makes much more sense because the success rate is so much higher than in endodontology. Yes, Hawaii became the first state to pass a bill banning the sale of sunscreen. The legislation prohibits the distribution of sunscreens containing chemicals oxybenzone, oxy, octinoxate. The scientists say contributes to uh, uh, ble coral bleaching. Um, it's estimated that 14,000 tons of sunscreen is believed to be deposited in oceans annually, with the greatest damage found in uh, popular reef areas in Hawaii and the Caribbean. Um, it, it is amazing. On one beach in Hawaii, they estimate 412 pounds of sunscreen was uh, deposited in the ocean every single day. Uh, that, that, that is just amazing. Um, yeah, but you have to take into account that all those many tons of sunscreen, they have been first put on and sprayed on the skins of the population, of the, of the people. And the skin is a perfect organ for resorption. So we should not believe that the sunscreen, that this just stays on our skin and does not interact with our system. As soon as you put something on your skin, it's going to interact with your immune system and it's going to be resorbed and it's going to get into your body. You have, uh, you just had 50 Americans come all the way over to Germany for your class. That, that's commitment to get 50 uh Americans to travel on the other side of the world to go listen to you. That, that, how was that course? Yes, it was amazing. So actually, we, we identified about 30 uh, dentists we wanted to invite to our special course uh, last weekend. And um, at the end, uh, uh, it turned out that uh, we invited 30 and 50, wanted, uh, 50 dentists wanted to come and they had been at the clinic for five days at our education center. So we had an amazing life surgery with um, a sinus lift and sinus implants. And we, they were uh, with another life um, placement of uh, the final prosthetics on 16 ceramic implants. Then we had a two-day course about biological dentistry and ceramic implants. And as well, we had a one-day course 
with Professor Alain Simon Pieri, who is talking about some techniques um, about uh, treating the bone and the gum. So it was an amazing weekend with, uh, with uh, those dentists. Well, I wish you would uh, create an online course for us on Dental Town. Um, there's 211,000 Americans uh, with an active dental license. And it would, um, they love the online CE, and that might be a great introduction uh, to you if you built us an online CE course. Would you consider that? Yeah, of course. I think we are, we are um, uh, with our technical equipment, we, are, um, uh, we could do that very high performance. So we, we, do, we started last year, one year ago, with uh, four channel full HD live streaming. So we've got four cameras, one on the ceiling of the surgical theater. We've got one in the lamp of the, um, uh, um, uh, in the surgical lamp. We've got one on my glasses and one intraoral camera. That means um, what the, the view the observer is going to have is amazing because um, uh, we've got four cameras and they show perfectly what's going on. So way bigger than what than what I would see because it's on the use screen it depends and so I would be happy to so we are uh, perfectly equipped for doing um, uh, life surgeries or life education um, you also talk about bone growing implants what, what do you mean by bone growing implants yeah bone growing implants mean that we have created Implants, I think the first implant in the world, which are able to grow new bone. And um, with that, we skip the bone graft and we skip a second procedure. We skip a lot of costs. We skip um, uh, um, other materials and we just follow biological laws. There is um, the biological law means that as soon as you create a stable space, between the remaining bone and the periost, or the Schneiderian membrane in the sinus. The Schneiderian membrane is nothing else than the periost on top of the bone. You just have to create a stable space and that is going to attract new bone. And you don't need any bone graft material. So I even, I believe that uh, it's a contraindication to put anything inside because the more you put inside, it will be an obstacle for the new growing bone. And um, so actually I started with this concept more than 25 years ago when I used the so-called Memphis system of Strauman, what it was developed by Professor Hemmele from uh, University of Zurich, where we placed um, uh, little screws into the bone and we put a membrane on top to hold the periost away from the from the bone and we would never put any bone graft inside. And after four months, when you reopened, there was new bone and much better bone than any bone graft could be because it was new bone built from the patient with um, lamella bone with a lot of with a vascularization. So if, if, you, if your patient is asking you, will the bone be still there in 20 years? You have to uh, answer the patient Yes, in case they still the vascularization. It's all about the vascularization. And if you build new bone, you get a perfect vascularization. Um, if you put a bone block or bone graft whatsoever, there is very poor or no vascularization. So we've created some very new shapes like the um, sinus implant, which is able to hold like, so we call it tent pole umbrella technique. So the implant itself is holding the, the sinus membrane, for example, um, in a very stable position and with the disc on top of the tip of the implant, it's creating a lot of space, so we call it the shadow. And the shadow underneath any given physical stable space, there are a lot of studies about that, is going to create new bone. And we've proven on many cases, many patients, you will see um, the the implant and there's nothing inside the sinus and then four months later you already see the bone and then maybe eight months or one year later you see all bone around the implant and it just has grown out of nothing just because of the uh, biological loss. 
you also were the founder of the first ever use of ultrasonic implants um, and uh, the use of ultrasonic uh, um, applications in membrane technology. Do you still use ultrasonic technology? No. It just turned, so in my opinion, it turned out that it does not work. So um, uh, about the ultrasonic uh, membrane technique, the idea at this time was that we first uh, placed with ultrasonic the, um, the polylactide pins uh, around the window of the sinus, and then we, we with the sign uh, with the PSO, we uh, welded the polylactide membrane on uh, membrane on top. Um, but the problem is that the polylactide is going to be resorbed, and resorption is means that it will be acidic. And resorption means that you're going to attract osteoclasts. And the least you want to have close to an implant is osteoclasts or an acidic environment. So it's contraproductive and we completely stopped that. So today we're just using auto autologous bone. We're collecting from different areas. We use the bone curing implants and we use the PIF membranes um, made, made out of the blood of the patient. So nothing artificial anymore. Well, um, you told me you only had one hour and you needed to go, go, go. And I just want to say, um, you, you need to run to another meeting, don't you? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, I just want to say that um, it's just, uh, it's so exciting. You, you mentioned Steve Jobs and he has a lot to do with this uh, conversation because uh, we're, our, you know, he's the one who really started the, the smartphone and uh, I love Steve Jobs' quote, uh, your time is limited, so don't waste it living somebody else's lives. And I love the fact that um, Albert Einstein said, great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. The me mediocre mind is incapable of understanding the man who refuses to bow blindly to conventional prejudices and chooses instead to express his opinions courageously and honestly. And I think it's pretty uh, just amazing uh, that you're willing to... Uh, take some of the stances that you have. It was a huge honor that you came on the program. I hope you make it some online CE uh, because uh, it, it turned a lot of people onto your, uh, your thoughts and your information and, and it'll make them think. I mean, you just can't stop the curiosity project and um, you know, den dentistry uh, needs uh, people to question everything that they believe and see if it withholds uh, um, new technology, new science, or what we call an inconvenient fact. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to finish that with another quote of Albert Einstein, who said, um, uh, if, um, if the bee is going to die four years later, humanity is going to die. And, but he was wrong, because the West took over the work of the bee. And so that is a very nice proof that there's always a wild card, uh, uh, negative and good ones. So you never know uh, what's coming up and that makes um, life so interesting. So thank you so much for inviting me. It was my pleasure. I had a lot of fun and hope to see you soon again. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope you have a great day. Yeah. Thank you. The same for you. Bye bye. Links, dadurch wurde meine Sehkraft extrem gestärkt wieder. Und gestern beim Entfernen von den Metallkappen, den Goldkappen, habe ich ein sehr, sehr angenehmes Gefühl bekommen im Bauch. Mein Bauch hat sich wieder richtig frei erweitert. sind meine Schultern voll beweglich, wo ich bis jetzt immer Probleme gehabt habe. Und seit 15 Jahren, seitdem ich diese Goldgeschichten im Mund habe, habe ich immer Kotschmerzen gehabt und die sind weg. Und ich kann jetzt plötzlich wieder aufrecht stehen. Vorher war ich immer so zusammengezogen und jetzt stehe ich da ganz normal und aufrecht und die Schulter sind frei. Das ist einfach super. Also allein von den körperlichen Auswirkungen hat sich das gelohnt, abgesehen von den Zähnen natürlich.